So let's take your Bibles and go to the book of Romans, if you would, please. If you don't have a, a Bible, I'm sure you can pull it up on your phone, the book of Romans. We're going to be looking at chapter 1. And as I uh, always do, whenever we start a new book study, I'm going to give a brief introduction to the book so you can understand a little bit about the background and who wrote it and why it was written. And if you're new to Cornerstone, this is what we do around here. We go straight through the Bible from cover to cover, Genesis to Revelation. And, and so we find our, our place here in the book of Romans. We finished uh, the book of Acts just prior to Christmas. And so now we're coming to the next book in the Bible, which is Romans. Now, if you were here for our study in the book of Acts, you might remember that the book of Acts ended with Paul in Rome standing trial before Emperor Caesar Nero. There's no detail in the Bible about how that trial went. Uh, all we can assume is that it went in Paul's favor because he obviously got released. He did a, a little bit more in terms of missionary travels after that. So even though we don't have the details, it must have gone favorably for, for Paul. And you would think that because Acts ends with Paul being in Rome, that the next book in our Bible is Romans, and it would make sense that Paul, the author of Romans, is writing from Rome, seeing as how he's there at the close of the book of Acts. But in fact, the book of Romans does not chronologically follow the book of Acts. Yes, Acts ends with Paul being in Rome, but the book of Romans actually fits chronologically back in the, in the book of Acts in chapter 18, when Paul was in Corinth. Because it was there in Corinth that Paul, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, penned this letter to the church at Rome around 57 to 58 AD, which was actually three years before he had ever gotten to Rome. So even though it follows the book of Acts, it chronologically would fit back in Acts 18 when Paul was in Corinth in Greece, and he wrote the book from that location. Paul did not plant this particular church here in Rome. He had never met the people to whom he is writing, although he is well acquainted with many of them because he lists 26 names at the end of this book, so he knows them at least from a distance. This church was not planted by Paul, as I said, which is typically the case. Whenever Paul would go on his missionary journeys, he would often plant a church, spend a little bit of time there, and then send a letter back to that church to see how they're doing. He didn't plant this church. It is believed that this church in Rome was planted because there were some Jews who traveled to Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. The Pentecost recorded in Acts chapter 2. And having gotten saved there because there was this great harvest of souls in Acts chapter 2, that there were Jews who became believers in Jesus and Yeshua as Messiah. And so after the Feast of Pentecost, they go back to Rome and they plant this church there now as Jewish believers in Jesus. And thus the makeup of the church of Rome was both Jewish believers and Gentile believers. And sometimes in, in Romans, Gentiles are just known as Greeks. So you have the Jews and you have the Greeks who make up this church here in Rome, which makes for a, um, a, a somewhat difficult, in terms of cultural differences, uh, blending together, because you have Jews who come from the standpoint of God's law, they had a familiarity with God, and those Jewish believers just had a, a foundation of knowing God and then receiving Christ as their Savior. Whereas the Greeks slash Gentiles, they have no knowledge of God, no knowledge of God's word. They, they are a part of a polytheistic society in the Greco-Roman culture, and, but they're believing in Jesus. And so you have these two very different cultures that are coming together in the church at Rome under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, which even though it creates a little cultural confusion, this is exactly the way the church should be. Because Jesus died for all, for every nationality, for every ethnicity, for every person of every uh, background to come together under the Lordship and the banner of Jesus Christ. So while the church at Rome had this uh, potentially cultural challenge, it also was consistent with what Jesus came to do by uniting all people from different backgrounds under his lordship. Now, most of Paul's letters that he writes in the New Testament, and Paul wrote two-thirds of our New Testament, most of the letters that Paul wrote to the various churches in the first century, 
dealt with some church problem or some church issue. But Romans is different. Paul doesn't address any kind of a church issue. The book of Romans really focuses more on God and His great plan of redemption for mankind. All right, one last bullet point as a background to this book, and this part is very important. There are several key words that are found more often in the book of Romans than any other book. And these key words lay some key doctrines uh, in the book of Romans. So if you're there in Romans chapter 1, uh, look for a moment at verse 1. And we're going to see one of the words that is found more in the book of Romans than any other New Testament book. Verse 1 of chapter 1, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. So circle the word gospel in your Bibles or highlight it in your electronic Bibles. And if you're taking notes, uh, the word gospel is mentioned 12 times in the book of Romans. As I said, that's more than any other New Testament book. It is the Greek word because Greek was the original language of the New Testament. It's the Greek word euangelion and it translates good news or good message. That's what gospel means. So whenever you're going to read the word gospel in the book of Romans, or whenever you hear that word thrown out, the gospel of Matthew, the gospel of Mark, gospel of Luke or John, it just means the good news or the good message. So that's one important word. Because the gospel is the good news that no matter what you've ever done in your life, salvation is available and the forgiveness of sins to all who believe in Jesus Christ. So that's the good news of this book. If you keep reading with me here in chapter 1, look at verse 2, separated to the gospel of God, which He promised before through His prophets in the Holy Scriptures, talking about the Old Testament, concerning His Son Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with proper, well, sorry, with power according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Through him we have received grace, there's the other word, grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. Verse 7, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, Grace, here it is again, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is the other word that is repeated more in Romans than any other New Testament book. It is the word grace, found 26 times in Romans. It is the Greek word charis. And you translate charis, it, it, it sometimes is translated love, it's sometimes translated mercy, but it basically means God's undeserved favor toward unworthy people. Do we have any unworthy people here today? And are you happy for God's grace? Yes and amen? Amen? I am. And so grace is an important word for us to understand. Again, it's mentioned more times in Romans than any other book, so we're going we're gonna to study it carefully. I just want to point out before I move on, verse 7 again, where it says, Paul writes, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. You know, sometimes we have this more modern notion that a saint is someone who's been, you know, venerated and uh, somebody who has died and they did a wonderful, a lot of wonderful things while they lived. And so, uh, you know, especially with those of you with Roman Catholic backgrounds, you understand there's a whole list of saints, people who have received sainthood. I just want you to know, okay, that, that that's a more modern way of looking at uh, people who have gone before us, but the reality is that we're not to venerate people, we're not to worship people, but that the Bible speaks of everyone who's a believer is a saint. The word in the Greek is hagios. It means one who has been separated unto the Lord. So in the truest biblical sense, every believer in Jesus is a saint. That's why Paul writes that way to all the saints. We're all saints. So try it out. You can call me Saint Gary at Wells. <laughs> It wears well on me, and um, I don't mind. Actually, I do. Don't, don't do that, but, it's, uh, but just out of fun. So, so you're a saint, I'm a saint, we're all saints if you know Jesus. Okay. Then there are some key verses here. 
This is all the introduction. It's at no charge for us. All right. Some key verses here. Chapter 1, look at verses 16 and 17. Paul writes here, inspired by the Spirit, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, first for the Jew and also for the Greek. By the way, that doesn't mean that the Jew is more special. In fact, Paul will later say that the Jew is first in priority, but also first in penalty, he's going to say in chapter 2. They're going to be more accountable because the Jewish race has been entrusted with this wonderful Savior. Jesus has come through the Jewish people. So there is this there is this opportunity for them to trust first because Jesus has come among them. And sadly, though, Jesus, it says he came among his own, but his own received him not, most of them. So they are first in privilege in that sense, but they are also first in penalty because they're most accountable. He'll talk about that in chapter two. But he writes there, he says, this is the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation. Everyone who believes first for the Jew, then also for the Greek. Verse 17, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. It's the third word that you find more in the book of Romans than any other book of the Bible, faith. It is found 39 times in this book. It is the Greek word pistis, and it translates belief, trust, and reliance on God, who He is and what He promises. So these are some important words that we're going to see repeated often. So I just wanted to remind you or set the stage up front, gospel, grace, and faith. Um, We need to learn a lot about all three of these words, but especially grace, especially grace. Those of you with Catholic backgrounds, you're going to struggle with embracing grace because you have been taught that the way to God is through your good efforts and your hard work, and do what you can to make God happy so that He's not upset with you. And the whole concept of grace is foreign really to all of us, but particularly those of you with Catholic backgrounds. And I pray that by the end of the book of Romans, we will all have embraced grace in its right and proper context in a healthy way to really understand the liberty we have in Christ. Not liberty for sinfulness, but the liberty that we have knowing that this is not dependent on me. This is all on Christ and what He's done for us. I just get to respond to what Christ has done. So it's a very freeing thing if you, if you come to embrace and understand this. Let me just briefly quote a few of the early church fathers who wrote about the impact of the book of Romans on them personally. Augustine would write in 386 A.D., He said, quote, a clear light flooded my heart and all the darkness of doubt vanished away, end quote, when he read the book of Romans. Martin Luther would write this in 1515. Now, Martin Luther was an an Augustinian monk. He was Catholic. And uh, again, the Catholic doctrine basically puts the emphasis on man to, to be good and do good works in order to get to God. And Martin Luther was burdened by this because it's this sense of like, how can I be good enough for God until he read the book of Romans and realized it was not about what he does for God, it's what God has done for him. And so it really launched the Protestant Reformation. Now, there are some Jewish believers in our congregation, but for the most part, we're Protestants and we're here because of a stream that came out of this revelation, Martin Luther realized Romans is about grace and faith in what God has done. It launches the Protestant Reformation. We're here in large part because the book of Romans moved in that man's heart to launch this Reformation. Here's what Martin Luther wrote in 1515. He said, quote, I greatly longed to understand Paul's epistle to the Romans, and nothing stood in the way but that one expression, quote, the righteousness of God. Because I took it to mean that righteousness whereby God is righteous and deals righteously in punishing the unrighteous. And night and day I pondered until I grasped the truth that the righteousness of God is that righteousness whereby through grace and sheer mercy He justifies us by faith, 
Thereupon I felt myself to be reborn and to have gone through open doors into paradise. This passage of Paul became to me a gateway to heaven, end quote. And so he, he posts his 95 thesis on the Wittenberg church door, and he's like, I'm no longer going to identify with the Catholic church in the sense that I can't work my way to heaven. And the emphasis on works, he came to understand, is a wrong emphasis, that it should be an emphasis on grace and faith. John Wesley, in 1738, quoting one more, he said, quote, I felt my heart strangely warmed when he read the, the, the book of Romans. He said, I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone, for my salvation, and an assurance was given me that he had taken my sins away, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death, end quote. Let's pause there and pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this book we're about to read. We thank you, Lord, for your word, for all of it. And we pray, God, with open eyes and ears and hearts, we would read and study and receive what you would say to us through the pages of the book of Romans. And particularly on this topic of grace, thank you, Lord, that you are a gracious and merciful God. And we pray that we would come to understand especially what grace is all about. And we love you, Lord, and we thank you that you first loved us and died on a cross for our sins. We give you this study now. Help us to learn, help us to receive, help us to grow in our faith. And we praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Well, I heard the story about a, a man who um, was very curious about what life would be like in heaven. And so he kept praying to God, you know, what will life be like in heaven? And his one main prayer request was, whether or not there would be baseball in heaven. This guy was a lifelong baseball fan. He just wanted to know, God, is there going to be baseball in heaven? That was his prayer. Finally, one day, an angel appeared to this guy. The angel said, I've been sent in response to your prayer. And the guy said, you mean in response to the prayer, whether or not there's baseball in heaven? The angel said, indeed. And I've come to tell you. And the guy said, all right, tell me. And the angel said, well, I've got some good news and I got some bad news. He said, the good news is there is baseball in heaven. He says, you know, there's, there's no evening in heaven. It's day all the time because of the glory of God. So, and there's no bad weather either. So every day is a beautiful day, meaning there's baseball every day, 24 seven in heaven. And this guy's just like, wow, this is amazing. It's an answer to my lifelong prayer. I'm so excited to know that there's baseball in heaven. And the guy said to the angel, well, what, what's the bad news then? And the angel said, well, you're pitching on Thursday. <laughs> now, there's some good news and there's some bad news as it relates to the book of Romans. The good news that I'll mention just briefly is that it is faith in Jesus Christ and what he has done for us that saves a person, not faith in what we can do for God by being a good person. Because there is nothing that we can do to compensate for the sin problem that we all have except to respond to what Christ has done by dying on a cross for the sin problem that we all have. So that's the good news. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the message that Jesus died on a cross for your sins and my sins, and that if you believe in him, and if you accept what he did for you by faith, you can be forgiven and saved. Now the question becomes saved from what? And here comes the bad news. And I'm going to spend the rest of today and next week and maybe even the week after talking about the bad news. So happy new year. <laughs> Welcome to church. But listen, Paul spends the first three chapters talking about the bad news. And here's why it's important to understand and hear and grasp the bad news. If you don't hear and understand the bad news, you will A, not understand the good news, certainly not appreciate it, and B, you won't even see your need for the good news. 
We have to hear the bad news. Nobody likes to go to the doctor and hear bad news. But if you don't hear the bad news, you can't hear what the remedy is. There's medicine, there's a cure. But I got to tell you, the bad news first so that you can appreciate the good news and see your need for the good news. So we got a lot of bad news to get through today and the next couple of weeks. Um, and keep coming because we're going to see who the real Christians are. <laughs> it's like, well, he told us last week there's going to be more bad news. I'm not going. I can sit home, watch online. I don't have to even be there. Okay. All right. I'm just telling you. You got to be here for the bad news too. And the bad news has to do with what we're saved from. And what we're saved from that Paul writes about here is God's wrath. And this is another word we have to add on our list of key words in the book of Romans, and it is the word wrath. It is the Greek word orge. It is found 12 times in Romans. And with the exception of the book of Revelation, which mentions this word 13 times, it is found more often in Romans than any other book. And in fact, if you say proportionally speaking, because Revelation has many more chapters in the book of Romans, you could still make the argument that proportionally speaking, the word wrath is found in Romans more than any other book of the Bible. And wrath means this, God's righteous anger his divine indignation and just punishment in response to human sin. And we have to understand his wrath if we're going to understand the good news. And so if you look in your Bibles there in chapter 1, if you have your Bible still open there to chapter 1, look at verse 18. First time the word wrath is mentioned here in the book of Romans is verse 18. And this is what it says. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all the ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Now, I got to read this again. This is important. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Okay, that's verse 18. Folks, listen. We got we to get this. When Christians go around saying, or worse, when pastors go around saying from the pulpit, well, God, God is love and love is God. He's like a warm blanket on a snowy day. Picture butterflies on a spring day, that's God. He's like the wind beneath my wings that makes me soar, okay? He's like raindrops on roses and whiskers on kittens. Those are a few of my favorite things. If we go around talking like that, okay? Now let me make it clear, God is love. There's a verse on it, that's his character. God is love, but that's only half the story. The other half of the story is that God is just and holy. And when we sin, it makes him angry. We have to get this. God is a just and holy God. Yes, God is love. That's only half the story. And it would be counter to his character for God to allow sin to go unpunished. He's angry about sin and he must punish it. Now, we get this on some small level, because if you're a parent and you have children, if your children deliberately, intentionally disobey you, and you don't impose some kind of consequences for their deliberate, intentional disobedience, you're a negligent parent. And the same is true about God. When we disobey God, when we sin against Him, if He, if he just overlooked sin and gave us a pass, it would undermine the righteous character and holiness of God. He cannot allow sin to go unpunished. And so if we present God as just this sympathetic, benevolent being who because of his love for us overlooks and tolerates our sin, well then we would be misrepresenting God at, at best and we would be maligning his holy character at worst. So, so we can't give half the picture. God is love, yeah, but God is just and holy and he is a God of wrath and he will punish sin and disobedience. 
And here's, here's the kicker to even all of that. Paul goes on to say, and by the way, no one has an excuse. Nobody has an excuse, and we are all guilty. And what Paul does is, in, in chapters 1 and 2, he's going to categorize all human beings in the world under three particular categories. And here are the categories, for those of you who are taking notes. He's going to talk about the unrighteous, the self-righteous, and the over-righteous. Now, these are all bad categories, and every human being in the world falls under one or multiple of these three categories. And, and so Paul is going to mention this here in the course of these first couple of chapters. And he's also going to tell us that God reveals himself uniquely to each of these categories of people. So that he is just in his judgments if after revealing himself to these three different categories of people, people still deny him and disobey, against, and disobey him. He's going to be just in his wrath, because Paul says he has revealed himself in specific ways to each of these three categories. Now, we're only going to have time today to get through the first category, which is the unrighteous. So again, you have to come back uh, next week for more punishment. But this is the first group we need to understand, the unrighteous. And if you have your Bibles there in Romans 1, I want you to look at verses 18 to 25 with me. Now, I already read verse 18. I'm going to read it again down through verse 25. So here we go. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest to them, for God has shown it to them. Verse 20, for since the creation of the world, circle creation, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without what? Excuse, so that we're all without excuse. Verse 21, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened, professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature, or some of your translations say the created things, rather than the creator who is blessed forever, amen. Okay, now, now listen, if, if that isn't a comma, if what I just read isn't a commentary on our culture today, I don't know what is. I mean, he writes this in the first century, and this is just as relevant now as it was then. And so what God does here is he indicts the first group, and, and they're referred to as the unrighteous. Now, in reality, all of us fall in this category, because Paul will later say in Romans, there's none righteous, no, not one. We're all unrighteous. But, in, but primarily, Paul is talking about the person who claims to have zero knowledge about God or the Bible, has, has never or rarely been to church. This is, this is the unrighteous informed person or the misinformed person. This is that proverbial, what about the guy on the island who's never heard? Is he accountable? Everybody talks about the guy on the island. I don't know who that guy is, but um, this is trying to answer the question, what becomes of the person who has never heard or doesn't want to hear? Like it's in their face, but they don't want to hear. And God's answer is they're guilty. Well, wait a minute, they never heard. And God says, no, they have heard. I've revealed myself to them. And how does Paul say that God has revealed himself to an unrighteous world? Creation. Through creation. So that men are without excuse. God says, creation testifies of me. That's why Paul, here in chapter 1, in verse 19, he says, God has made his existence plain to people. But verse 18 says, but they have suppressed the truth by their wickedness. See, there are people who, who cannot deny the existence of God, but the reason they suppress the truth is because they just want to live their evil, sinful lives. So I don't want to acknowledge God, so I'm going to pretend like He doesn't exist. Meanwhile, the reality is the existence of God is undeniable. 
That's why Paul writes there in verse 20, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes, people say, well, I can't see God. Yeah, but his invisible attributes are clearly seen because of his handiwork, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, so that people are without excuse. Look, in other words, you have to work really, really hard at denying the, ins- the existence of God. You have to work hard at that because he is so plainly seen in the handiwork of creation. I mean, when you consider, when you consider the complexities of the universe, the interdependence of the systems of the cosmos, when you look at the uniqueness, the intricate details how amazing, for example, the human body is. It, you cannot, with an ounce of intellect, deny the existence of God. You have to be completely in denial of a creator to think that all of this just randomly happened over long periods of time. It just all came into existence. It, friends, that takes a lot more faith than to believe what the Bible says. You got to have more faith to believe that the random, spontaneous mutations and gradual modifications got us all this. Really? That's what we're supposed to believe? Listen to Sir Isaac Newton, who is considered the father of modern physics. He said this, quote, he said, this most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. This being governs all things, not as the soul of the world, but as Lord over all. And on account of his dominion, he is wont to be called Lord God, universal ruler, end quote. Consider the complexity of life in the universe. Let me just give you a few stats, friends. The earth. The earth is 25,000 miles in circumference. It weighs six septillion, 588 sextillion tons, yet hangs suspended in space. It spins on its axis at 1,000 miles an hour. It careens through space around the sun at 67,000 miles per hour. Consider lightning. A bolt of lightning travels an average distance of eight miles. A single bolt contains 15 million volts. That voltage could power one million light bulbs for life. That's a single lightning bolt. Consider the human heart. It's roughly the size of your fist. It weighs about a half a pound, yet it does enough work in 12 hours to lift the equivalent of 65 tons off the ground. If you were to place a coin just the size of a quarter on the palm of your hand, the area that that quarter covers on the palm of your hand covers one yard of blood vessels, four yards of nerves, 25 nerve ends, 100 sweat glands, 3 million cells. And I could go on and on. In other words, when you look at a watch, it screams watchmaker. When you look at a house, it screams carpenter. When you look at an automobile, it screams manufacturer. And when you look at creation, it screams creator. His handiwork is evident. It's not this result of random successive gradual modification, but it's the handiwork of God. Jeremiah the prophet said in Jeremiah 32, verse 17, Ah, Lord God, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. But what the world would have you to believe What modern science would have you believe is that one day, way back when, there was an ultraviolet ray from the sun that put a freckle on your forehead. And that freckle over years became an eyeball. (laughs) And then it sank into a socket of its own, started to move and you could start to see and you became a salamander. (laughs) And then you crawled out of a pond and you scraped your belly on some rocks and just so to compensate where the scrapings were on your belly, you started to grow legs. And then you stood upright and you became an ape. (laughs) And then you found a club 
And then you, not a club that some of you go to, a club club. <laughs> and then you killed your food. And then you made some clothes. And then you got a job. <laughs> at Walmart. <laughs> the end. That's the way they want you to believe. That's what they want you to believe. Friends, that is an insult to my intellect. That's why Paul writes here in verse 21, they have become darkened in the foolishness of their minds. Because people are believing something that is nonsense. Now, why does the world want you to believe that kind of nonsense? It was just all evolutionary, and they still call it a theory, friends, because it's never going to be proven. It's an evolutionary process, gradual modification, random, successive things. All, why do they want you to believe that? Here's the reason. Because if you can deny the existence of God, then somehow you don't have to be accountable to Him, you think. They don't believe in God. We're going to suppress it by our wickedness. We're going to just pretend like we don't see His handiwork through the universe. All these things are explainable through scientific theories and random successive modifications. We're going to deny God because in denying God, then somehow a person thinks that he or she is not accountable to God. But God says the whole time, you can't get away with that. I'm too obvious in the universe. And that's why Paul says man has no excuse. And that's why he writes here further, talking about how they've been darkened in the foolishness of their minds, because he writes here that mankind has inverted God's divine order. What's God's divine order? God is supreme, then he created man to have dominion over creation. Here's what our world has done, and Paul outlines it in Romans 1. They've inverted it. Now creation is supreme, man is secondary, we worship creation, the created things. That's what Paul says. And God has been relegated to some third level if you even believe in him. That's why Paul writes in verse 25 that, we've, that the people have exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature, the created things, rather than the creator. Now think about this, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, this is a yes or no question. Yes or no. Generally speaking, there is more of an obsession with the planet and the environment than with God in our country today. Yes. Of course there is. It's all about carbon footprint. It's all about going green. It's all about recycling, saving the sea turtles, saving the spotted owl, all the while we'll kill our unborn babies. Is that inverted or what? You go to South Florida, you see all these warning signs, penalty, punishment for fines. You disturb these little sea turtles. Okay, I love sea turtles. They're cute little creatures. God made them too, okay? But they are not more valuable than a child inside a mother's womb. They're not. It's all inverted. We're worshiping the created things rather than the creator. I, I had this encounter, this is several years ago. I was downtown in, in Georgetown in DC and I was standing outside in a line to the Apple store. Now, it wasn't there because I went to get the latest phone. I'm not that guy, okay? I was there because I had to get some kind of repair. I don't even remember why I was there, but I was in a line outside outside on the sidewalk, and this guy came up to me, I think he was like a third year freshman from Georgetown. <laughs> and he has this clipboard, he has a clipboard in one hand and he has an empty tuna can in the other hand. And he sees me and he's standing, he's just going down the line, he goes, excuse me sir, excuse me. Do you know what I'm holding here? And I said, yeah, I, I think it's, a, it's an empty tuna can. He goes, right, you are. He says, do you know what the problem is? I said, I'm sure you're going to tell me. <laughs> he says, yes, I will. He says, are you outraged? Are you outraged by the bludgeoning of tuna in our world today? How tuna have been bludgeoned all over the world, and then their little bodies have been stuffed into millions of cans just like these. And he says to me with his clipboard in hand, would you like to sign a petition today to end the senseless slaughter of tuna? <laughs> I looked at him and I said, no, but I tell you what, you've really made me hungry for a tuna fish sandwich. <laughs> I went out and had the biggest tuna fish sandwich that day. It was delicious. What is happening? <laughs> 
what is happening in our world today? I'll tell you what's happening. We have elevated creation above creator. We've inverted God's divine order. We are darkened in the foolishness of our minds because we have suppressed the existence of God even though he has manifested himself because of our wickedness. And therefore the wrath of God is gonna be poured out because man is without excuse. David would write in Psalm 19, verses one to four, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. God is telling us to an unrighteous world, my existence is undeniable and you are accountable to me and no one has an excuse. Now there is more bad news as I shared that we'll be talking about next week, but just so that we can always end the bad news with a reminder of the good news, would you go to Romans chapter five and we'll close with these two verses. Romans chapter five. Because Paul here in Romans five directly addresses the solution to the wrath that we all deserve. Romans 5, 8 and 9. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we have been saved from what? Wrath through him. Father, we end on that note because we want to always be reminded that the bad news has been overcome by the good news, but we can't appreciate nor will we see our need for the good news unless we first understand this bad news. So thank you, Lord, for your word, all of it. You are a just and a holy God, and you are angered by sin. But thanks be to God, thank you, Lord, that through Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross, we can escape the wrath that we deserve because you are a loving and a merciful Father. So as we go through the next few chapters to understand all of this, we pray that we would be reminded of that. We can escape your wrath because of what Christ has done. And we give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen and amen. God bless you all.